Redwall by Brian Jakes. Chapter 8. Clooney lay with his one good eye half open. From beneath his slitted lid he watched Sela the vixen. The sly old devil was definitely up to something. He was certain of it. Clooney had secretly questioned Fangburn about the conversation that had gone on between Sela and her son. There was no doubt about it. The Voxes were trying to dupe the warlord. Clooney had cursed Fangburn for twenty different kinds of an idiot. Fancy not being able to read and allowing Sela to write out a message. Imagine letting Chicken Hound go free without first getting the scroll read. If he had been a little fitter, he would have personally slain his oafish captain. But as it was, Clooney kept silent about it all. Even if Sela was playing a double game, he needed the fox's healing powers to regain his health and strength. Meanwhile, Clooney the Scourge made his own counter-espionage moves. He allowed Sela to minister to his wounds, but he secretly stopped taking the herbs and potions to help him sleep. Early next morning, Chicken Hound returned. He carried a bag laden with medicinal ingredients. Clooney feigned sleep, but secretly he observed the foxes closely. They nodded and winked at each other quite a bit. When they were reasonably sure he was asleep, the two held a hurried, whispered conversation. And though, unfortunately, he could not hear what they said, their behavior was secret enough to make Clooney sure he was right. They were planning a double cross. Clooney could not tell any of his officers of his suspicions. He kept everything to himself. This way, there could be no possible leak of secrets. Clooney was content to watch and wait, getting a little stronger each day. Then after a while, he came up with a fiendishly simple plan. He ordered that the room be cleared. He wished to be alone so that he could rest. When he was quite sure that he would not be disturbed, Clooney took a scroll and parchment from the bedside table. He drew a diagram, complete with pointing arrows, horde positions, line of attacks and defense, together with written instructions. It was a plan for the second full-scale invasion of Redwall Abbey. Clooney made it clear that the success of the attack depended solely on the battering ram breaking through the main gate. When he had finished writing, Clooney pushed the parchment under his pillow, taking care to leave just a little corner of it out, jump, jutting out. His officers would be too slow and dull to notice it a tiny scrap of parchment showing from beneath the pillow. But even if they should, they would attach no importance to it. But Sela the Fox would. Clooney settled down to wait. Red Tooth and Fangburn returned with their captive guest an hour later. Clooney stretched himself luxuriously and yawned aloud. Ah! I had a nice, peaceful nap without you three clattering about the room and creating a noise. How's that tree felling coming along? Red Tooth leaned upon his spear. Shouldn't take too much longer now, Chief. Order some of them to get to a good blaze going so the trunk be fired and hardened. Clooney flexed his injured tail slowly. Good. Make sure that all the branches are cut off close to the trunk. It'll make it easier to carry. Now, Fox, how about changing these bandages and give me something to make me sleep tonight? That stuff you gave me yesterday wasn't much use. I was tossing and turning for hours before I got any rest. Sela made a sweeping, servile curtsy. Now that my son has brought my new ingredients, I can certainly give you medicine to make you sleep, sir. I guarantee you'll go off like a bug in a blanket, if you'll pardon the expression, sir. Just as long as it gets me to sleep, said Clooney, smiling inwardly. That night, Clooney allowed Red Tooth and Fangburn to guzzle their fill from a cask of barley wine that had been found in the church cellars. He gave Sela permission to drink also. Clooney watched as the fox pretended to drink as much as the barley wine as the rat captains. While she was doing this, Clooney also pretended to take his sleeping medicine. Clooney and Sela continued with their patonomy, neither letting a drop pass their lips. It was late night. Clooney joined in the snores of his drunken officers. The room was comfortably warm. A lone candle flickered in a socket. Clooney felt the pillow move slightly. Sela was taking the bait! Clooney gave a big imitation snore and smacked his lips contentedly. Someday he must learn to play chess. He bet himself that he would be unbeatable. Clooney also made a wedger with himself that the plans would be back, safely tucked under the pillow. 
by morning and that Celia would have an accurate copy of them hidden away somewhere. Now he can catch a few hours sleep. No doubt the mice would be interested to learn of a, learn of a scheme to attack the main gate with a battering ram. They would straighten the gatehouse and deploy the main body defenders in the muted area. Kalini could have laughed out loud. While they were defending the gate, he would be tunneling under the southwestern corner of the abbey wall. Chapter 9 The deep, warm, brazen voice of the Joseph Bell tolled across the tranquil meadows, its echoes fading in the leafy depths of the mossflower wood. It was eleven o'clock on the night of the full moon. Inside cavern halls, the candles burned bright. Most of the woodland defenders and redwall mice had retired to their beds. Those who preferred to stay awake were gathered by invitation of Matthias and Methuselah to a party supper. All who attended wished them well on their quest. Abbot Mortimer took to the floor. My friends, redwall mice and honored guests, we are gathered here tonight, not only to pay tribute, but add, to add our heartfelt good wishes to Matthias and Brother Methuselah. May they have success and fortune in their venture this night, and may our abbey soon be enhanced by the restoration of the sword that belonged to the Martin the Warrior. The abbot took his seat among cries of, Hear, hear! There was much paw shaking and fur padding. Matthias felt deeply honored, but very impatient. The hourglass had to empty twice more before the crucial time he awaited. He stole a sideways glance at his companion. Methuselah had, could hardly stop his eyelids from drooping. The hard work they had done, combined with a nervous tension, were beginning to tell upon the old gatehouse keeper. Matthias nudged him gently. Wake up, old one. If you're tired, I'll help you to your room. Constance and I can take the shield up to the threshold. You get a good night's sleep. We'll tell you all about it in the morning. Methuselah came wide awake with indignation. You'll do nothing of the sort, you young scallywag. I'll give you a ten-second start, and I'll still beat you to the top of the wall. Do you want to try me? Constance coughed and spluttered upon a candy chestnut. She roared with laughter. <laughs> I would have tempted if I were you, Matthias. He's liable to beat you hollow in his present mood. The old mouse, seeing the humor of the situation, began to chuckle. And don't think I couldn't, you great stripey lump. Here, what do you say we put these young mouse up in the dormitory? It's way past his bedtime. You and I could go to the threshold together. Constance and Methuselah collapsed against each other, laughing helplessly. It was all Matthias could do to keep a straight face. He pretended to take offense at Methuselah's statement. Why, you pair of old relics! It would not take me two ticks to bring you some warm milk and tuck you in your own beds. Then I'd be free to get on with the job myself. The three friends laughed until tears streamed down their cheeks. Methuselah held his sides as he spoke between gusts of merriment. I say, Constance, <laughs> you old froggy! <laughs> you better come along with us! <laughs> Matthias is a bit old for this sort of thing! <laughs> Matthias had fallen off of his chair. He waved his paws, pleading for the joking to stop, as he rolled about on the floor, exploding from bouts of giggling to fits of laughter. Basil Stag hair tut tutted severely as he remarked to Ambrose Spike. <coughs> Dreadful table, table manners. Just look at these three, kicking up a hobbleballoo like that. Eating a serious eating's a serious business. They have a touch to bite us up, or you know. Aye, so I see to the hedgehog. Here, you don't suppose they'd mind, do you? Not at all, not at all, dear fellow, said Basil, regaling, as he shared the contents of the three plates between himself and Ambrose. Saves it all going to waste. What, what? It was fifteen minutes before one o'clock in the morning. Three figures crossed the abbey gardens as the moon broke from behind a drifting cloud bank. The nearby pond was bathed in a silver sheen, parts of the sandstone wall reflecting back a wavery bluish light. Constance and Methuselah carried lanterns. Martha and Matthias bore the warrior's shield upon his arm. They ascended the wall steps in single file, acknowledging the murmured good wishes of those on sentry duty. Matthias had decided against trying the shield in his niche before the appointed hour. He felt somehow that they must abide by the rules of the verse, waiting until day's first hour on the night of the full moon. It just had to be so. No use tempting fake old damn fortune. 
Solemnly, the three friends gathered around the carving upon the rapids. Matthias clutched the shield tightly, waiting for the stroke of one. High above the small world of red wall, the moon also waited, suspended in velvety space like a pale gold coin. It seemed that the minutes stretched into an eternity in which silence reigned over all. The great Joseph Bell boomed down at once. It was one o'clock, day's first hour. Slowly, vertently, Matthias lowered the shield of Martin down onto the stone circle that had been carved many long years before to receive it. The shield made a mild clanking sound as it was laid to rest in his niche. It fitted perfectly into the stone receptacle. All three creatures stood back a pace to see what might happen. Matthias was first to cry out, Look! The shield is reflected in the moonlight back into the sky! Moonlight seemed to concentrate upon the highly polished steel dome and its designated position, singing in it, sending an intense beam of white light back off into the night sky. Bethuselah blinked. Holding his paw across his eyebrows, he stared into space, trying to follow the path of the reflected moonlight. Truly it is a most beautiful, wondrous sight, he breathed. Alas, my old eyes are not what they were. All I see is a light shooting off into infinity. Wait, look at the abbey roof, Constance murmured. The beam cuts right across the top gale. I can see the weather van as clearly as it was day. Good heavens, Matthias squeaked. You're right, the abbey weather vane. It's the one thing that's caught in the path of the light. The north, the north, Methuselah shouted. It's the weather vane on that points north. That is where the sword must be. Solemnly, the three friends placed their paws one on top of the other. At long last, the mystery was solved. They knew now where the sword of Martin the Warrior had been for countless years, on the arm of a weather vane, porting north. However, it was three rather disconsolate creatures that sat down to early breakfast after a few hours' fitful sleep. They encountered a major problem. How to get the sword down? What a pity we haven't got about thirty or forty extra long ladders that we could tie together to reach the roof, muttered Constance. Oh, be quiet, Constance, Matthias grumbled. That must have been the tenth time you said that in the last hour. Sorry, only trying to help, she mumbled. Methuselah pushed his porridge aside. There are only two ways that you can help, my friend. One, by keeping silent. Two, by turning yourself into some creature that could climb all the way to the top of that roof. A bird or a squirrel or something. They sat and stared at Methuselah in amazement. A solution of stunning simplicity had been found. I do hope that Mrs. Squirrel hasn't decided to sleep in, said Matthias. She'll need an early start if she's going to make it back by lunchtime. Mrs. Squirrel, or Jess, as she liked to be called, was only too pleased to oblige her friends from Redwall. Having been given full instructions by Matthias, Jess stood at the base of the immense abbey building. The squirrel performed what looked like an intricate acrobatic dance, followed by several cartwheels at lightning speed. She's just limbering up, Mr. Squirrel explained to Matthias. A large crowd of mice and woodlanders had gathered to witness the epic ascent. Not even in the oldest recorded writings was there any mention of a creature venturing to climb as high as the abbey roof. It was a most formidable task, for the roof soared to nearly twice the height of the bell tower. Jess elbowed her way through the throng. She kissed Mr. Squirrel, patted her son Silent Sam upon the head, then shook paws with Constance, Matthias, and Methuselah. With a brisk, cheery manner, she scooped up a handful of soil, rubbing it into her paws to give some extra gripping power. Lovely day for a climb, she remarked half-handedly. Then away she went, paw over paw, up the massive abbey face. The lower wall with its arched sandstone windows frame held no difficulties for the tough squirrel. She climbed with speed and alacrity. Lifting herself over the gutter with a neat flick of her bushy tail, Jess clattered across to a small slate side roof. She was temporarily lost to view at the start of the second stage. As she came into sight again, the watchers below could not help but notice that the climb was more difficult. Progress was slower. Mr. Squirrel cupped his paws and called up, Are you all right up there, Jess? 
Latching her tail around a projecting gargoyle, Jess shouted back, Well, I'm making headway, my dear. This stone, though, is a bit rough on the old paws and claws, not like good old wood or tree bark. Chins went up, heads tilted back, the crowd below followed the ascent of the plucky Jess Squirrel. By the time she seemed, by this time she seemed to the watchers to be rapidly diminishing in size as she forged upwards. Formal, who was never too keen on heights, covered his eyes with a paw. Grr, me dearie, dearie me, she looking like an ugly bird all the ways up there. Nay, I'm afraid to look. Although Matthias had agreed with Formal, he continued looking upwards. Jess was reduced to a mere speck now. The young mouse gritted his teeth, willing the brave squirrel onwards. Go on, Jess, you could do it. Not too far to the gable now. The crowd fell silent. All that could be heard was silent Sam sucking his tiny paw as he clutched onto his father's tail. Suddenly, Winifred the otter broke the quiet. Look, Jess has made it over the gutter. She's on the roof. A massive cheer went up. The squirrel was on the last lap. Now she would have to call and to play all of her climbing ability to keep going up the treacherously steep, smooth slates. The thistle polished agedly at his spectacles. Where is she now? Will someone please enlighten me? She's on the top of the roof, walking with a foot either side of the apex toward the gabe, yelled Abbot Mortimer. Methuselah sniffed. No need to shout, Mother Abbot. I'm only hard of sight, not a hearing. Mr. Jess clapped his paws joyfully. <gasps> She's made it! My Jess has made it! Amid the riot of jubilation, Matthias watched. The weather vane moved slightly, indicating that Jess, actually out upon the north corner, must be trying to retrieve the sword. What a daring climb! What a courageous creature! Jess Squirrel would certainly take her place in the annuals of Redwall Abbey. Mr. Squirrel held Silent Sam up to his arms. Look, Sam! Mom's done it! She's on the way back down now! Silent Slam clutched his little paws over his head. He shook them like a tiny champion. Nobody in the whole world was a better climber than his mother. Matthias waited for a glimpse of the sword, but Jess was not halfway down when a shout of consternation arose from the crowd below. Look out! She's being attacked by sparrows! Sure enough, the fierce birds were whirling in close to the intrepid Jess. They tried to peck at her, seeking to dislodge her or distract her enough to make her fall. It was a fearsome, sickening drop should she lose her grip. Matthias took command. He acted swiftly. Hurry! Get the sixth best field and harvest miles archers! Those birds have got to be stopped immediately! The angry sparrows persisted with their savage assault. Jess kept on descending resolutely. She couldn't seem to defend herself. The abbot and Constance had to leap forward to restrain Silent Sam. He had left his father and was trying to scramble up the base of the abbey wall with a small dagger clenched in his teeth. Constance attempted to reason with Sam. Stay clear, little one. You only distract your mom. Look, she's doing splendidly. An old bunch of sparrows can't bother her. Stand back now. Here come the bow mice. Speedily notching shaft to their springs, the archers angled their bows upwards. Do not aim to kill any of the birds the abbot cried, shooting to frighten them off. Shoot! Matthias yelled. The first volley of arrows was launched. They fell short of the sparrows. Jess carried on scrambling downwards, beating off attackers whenever she had a free paw. They're getting within range now, shouted Matthias. Aim! Fire! The mouse archers set off a hail of arrows that came close enough to cause a scatter among the sparrows. Taking advantage of their brief confusion just clambered down onto the small side roof the tenacious birds regrouped and came at her again below the bow mice stood ready she'll make it down ambrose spike yelled one more good volley just scare them off ready fire called matthias the deadly shafts hissed upwards causing a mad flurry among the attackers Purely by accident, a stray arrow struck one young sparrow, came tumbling down the slope of the small roof, dropping to earth like a stone, the arrow sticking in his leg above the knee joint. Cheated of their intended victim, the sparrows flew off, chirping bad-temperedly. Consta snatched up a woven rush-washing basket. 
Holding the small sparrow firmly with her paw, she gripped the arrow in her teeth, yanking it clear from the bird's leg. The badger then upended the basket, imprisoning the maddened sparrow beneath it. Shouts of joy mingled with relief greeted Jess as she dropped purely, wearily to the grass. Whew! she gasped. What a wild bunch of savages their sparrow are! Thought they had me once or twice back there! Before the heroic squirrel could be united with her family, Matthias came dashing across. Jess! Where is the squirrel sword? he panted. The squirrel shrugged and shook her head. It wasn't there, Matthias. I climbed out along the north pointer and actually saw the shape of the sword in the holder where it was supposed to rest. There was even some loose, rusty wires that have that may have held in position at one time or another. But there was definitely no sword. I'm sorry, Matthias. I tried my best. Of course you did, Jess, said Matthias, hiding his disappointment. Thank you for your much valiant efforts. Half an hour later, the crowd had dispersed and gone about their business. Matthias sat with his back against the abbey wall, his mind in a turmoil. All that hard work, solving the clues, burning midnight oil, endangering the lives of his friends, had all come to nothing. He beat his paws against the stone of the abbey, a tear of frustration gleaming in his eye. Why, Martin? Why? he moaned. The captive sparrow fluttered her wings against the upturned basket. I kill you! She chattered angrily at Matthias. I kill you, mouse! Let war be free, you dirty worm! Matthias peered through the cracks of the insulting prisoner. Oh, shut your beak, you little monster! He muttered. You're in no position to kill anyone. The sparrow's venomous temper had increased. King Bull Sparrow, he killing you! My dead quick fast! Matthias laughed mirthlessly. <laughs> Will he indeed? Well, you tell King Think Gummy that if you should bump into him again, tell him you met Matthias the warrior, then, I'll, then I don't kill that easily, my bad-tempered little friend. This last statement sent the young sparrow off in a veerable dance of rage. Mouse no friend of Warbeak! Kitty! Kitty it! Matthias tapped the basket with his foot. Listen, Warbeak, if that's your name, you better improve your temper, or you'll find yourself without food to eat or any medical attention. So if I were you, I'd sit quietly for a while and think about it. Matthias spun upon his heel and marched off, the enemy sparrow's chirp still ringing in his ears. No one of food! No needy intelligence! Warbeak Sparrow! All brave! Get But I uh, sighed wearily. There was just no talking to some creatures. Chapter 10 Seela the fox continued, continued to complain. She must have a certain type of herb that was not in her kit. It could be only found in mossflower wood at the dark of night. Clooney listened to the fox's pleas, knowing that they were merely an excuse to gain her freedom. He paused as if to deliberate, watching the hopeful expression on Seela's face. Hmm, I can see that you need this herb, so why don't you send your son Chicken Hound to get it? Seela was never stuck for a ready answer. No, no, I'm afraid that's useless, sir. He's too young and inexperienced. Chicken Hound wouldn't know where to start looking. Clooney nodded sympathetically. I, you're probably right. I suppose I'll have to stretch to a point. You can go off to the woods and search for this vital herb. But be warned, Fox! There will be two rats with you all the time. One false move and I'll have that bushy tail of yours to trim the collar of my war cloak. Is that understood? Seela's head bobbed vigorously. Of course, sir. What reason would I have to play you false? I'm looking forward to a good share of plunder once I've healed you and Redwall is conquered. The huge tail snaked out and caressed the fox. Of course you are, my friend. How silly of me. Clooney actually smiled. Sheila shuddered. That evening, Sheila left the church, accompanied by Red Tooth and Fangburn. Secretly, she could have danced with daylight. Delight. Only two cards? With their knowledge of moss flower, Sela could quite easily give them the slip for fifteen minutes or so. Back at the church, Clooney had risen from his bed. He attempted an exploratory walk, leaning on his banner as he stumped gingerly around the room. 
good. In a short while, he could be back to his old self again. Clooney spoke aloud to the picture of Martin, bound to his standard. Ha! That fox usually give those idiots of mine the slip. Then she deliver my false plans to your abbot. It's all going quite smoothly. But a blow to your side, eh, mouse? Twilight tinged moss flower wood. Sila sniffed the breeze. She glanced up at the sky. It would soon be dark if she could keep her rendezvous with the mouse abbot at the old stump. Red Tooth and Fangburn were both unhappy and uncomfortable. For the last hour, Sela had them led them through stinging nettles, swarm of midges, and marshy ground. They blundered along, hacking at the undergrowth with their cutlass and spear. I think we must be somewhere near the mouse, Abby, Fangburn said. Stow the gab, keep your eyes on the fox, Red Tooth snarled. I wish I'd bring some lanterns along with us, Fangburn whined. Red Tooth's already dangerously thin patience snapped. He grabbed hold of his sniveling crony and started shaking him. Listen, duckhead, if you don't stop your moaning, I'll chop your tongue out with my cutlass. Do you hear me? Fangburn struggled free. He angrily jabbed at Red Tooth with his spear. You try anything without a blunt old bread knife and I'll spear your gizzard before you can blink an eye. Oh, you will, will you? Yes, I will, smarty rat. Then take that big mouth. Ow, punch me, would you? I'll soon show you. Together, the rats crashed into a prickly bush, kicking, biting, and pummeling each other. Claws, tails, and teeth came into play. They went at it, hammer and tongs, for several minutes, and to Red Tooth emerged the victor. His nose was bleeding, and he had lost a tooth, but he was in better shape than his opponent. Fangbird crawled miserably out of the wrecked bush. Both eyes were blackened, a chunk of his left ear was missing, and his whole body was covered in long, raking claw marks and prickles. He bent painfully to retrieve his spear. Seizing the opportunity, Red Tooth planted him a mighty kick on the bottom. His nose plowed up a furrow of soil. Red, panting furiously, Red Tooth berated Fangburn. You half-witted fool! Now see what you've done! While we were, you were busy assaulting a superior officer, you let the fox escape! Fangburn sat up. He went through discolored eyes. I let the fox escape? Me? Oh no, you were the one in charge. You let her get away, not me. Wait till I report this to Clooney. I tell, I will tell him that, Will you shut up? Red Tooth yelled. It's no use us to here, stand here arguing. We'll get better searching for the fox. I'll go this way and you go that way. The first one to find her keeps shoving, shouting until the other one arrives. Have you got that? Now get moving. The two rats slumbled off through the woods in different directions. Meanwhile, in another part of Mossflower Wood, Sela sneaked along, looking from left to right. There was the three-topped oak. There was the abbey wall. Ah, here it was, the old stump. The moonlight illuminated the scene clearly. She was alone. Where was the mouse abbot? Heavy paw clamped itself around Sela's neck from behind. Her tongue shot out. Shrugging, struggling uselessly, she gagged and choked. Constance's gruff voice growled into her ear. Be still, fox, or I'll snap your neck like a dead twig. Sela froze. There was nothing more dangerous than a fully grown badger. Their strength and ferocity were renowned. Constance's free paw snapped the herb pouch from the fox's belt. She shook the contents out onto the stump. Grabbing the copy of Clooney's invasion plans, she studied it briefly, then stuffed it into her belt. Your abbot was supposed to meet me with the reward, Sela whispered. The badger's eyes blazed with contempt as she spun the vixen around. Here's your reward, traitor! Oop! Constance dealt Sela a sharp blow between the ears. The fox fell in a senseless heap. Constance looked behind a tree and called out in a high-pitched voice, Over here! I got the fox! Quick, over here! Red Tooth was first to arrive. He came dashing through the bushes and halted at the sight of the unconscious fox among the ferns. Hell's teeth, fox! Where's Fangburn? What the devil did you mean slinking off like that? Get up on your feet and answer me! Constance emerged from behind the tree. I don't think she'll wake up for a while yet. Fancy meeting you here, rat! Red Tooth got over his surprise quickly. 
Seeing the badger unarmed, he swished his cutlass through the air and smiled menacingly. Well, well, it's the friend of the mice. So we meet again, badger. Constance stood tall, her huge, paw, her huge paws folded. Red tooth, isn't it? I still remember you. See, you still remember me from your defeat at the wall. I told you then we had a score to settle. Red Tooth bared his teeth and snarled. I'm going to enjoy this, Badger. I'll make sure you die slowly. The rat leaped at Constance, swinging his cutlass expertly. For a heavy Badger, his adversary moved light and skillfully. Nearly sidestepping a cutlass thrust, she cuffed the rat smartly on the point of the nose. Stung into retaliation, Red Tooth charged Constance with the point of his blade. A fierce kick in the ribs and a swift chop to the claw sent the rat and the cutlass in opposite directions. Red Tooth lay winded upon the ground. Constance leaned over him. Get up and retrieve your weapon, the badger growled. As Red Tooth stood, he grabbed a handful of earth and flung it at Constance's eyes. The big badger staggered back, rubbing at the grit which clogged her vision. The rat picked up the cutlass and swung at it, slashing wildly at his enemy's thick fur. He scored several hits. Suddenly, panic gripped him. The wounded badger had seized the blade regardless of his keen edge. Constance pulled Red Tooth in close. She gave a sideways push, snapping the cutlass blade in two pieces. Kicking the rat over his back, she flung the broken blade away and grabbed the rodent's tail tightly with both paws. Red Tooth screamed in terror as he felt himself leave the ground to go spinning aloft over the badger's head. With his tail pulled taunt and the wind whistling through his fangs, Red Tooth howled as the trees went by in a green blur. Like an athlete throwing the hammer, Constance whirled on her hind legs faster and faster till she threw her burden with a colossal heave. Red Tooth would have flown a record distance had there not been a stout sycamore tree several yards away. Ignoring her injuries, Constance called down to the surrounding, surrounding woods. Over here! He's over here! Then she limped swiftly off in the direction of Redwall with the captured plans. Only moments later, Fainburn came blundering through the ferns. He tripped upon the groaning fox who was just coming around. Here, what happened? Where's Red Tooth? He asked anxiously. Sela sat up, rimming her hand, her head, trying to recognize her surroundings. She saw the old stump littered with her herbs and potions. The pouch lay nearby. Holding her head with both paws, she tried to halt the thumping ache. Damn that hydra's hide, badger's hide. She'd taken the plans from Sela as if she was confiscating acorns from a baby mouse. So much for the rich rewards. Fangburn prodded Sela with a spear. Hey, you, pay attention! I asked you where Red Tooth is! Sela probed a loosened tooth with her tongue. Leave me alone! How should I know? Fangburn persisted. Now listen, Fox, I want to know what's going on here. I'm sure I heard Red Tooth calling out. Hell's whiskers. Wait until Clooney gets to hear about this. Sela pointed a shaky paw. That, there's your rat. By that big old sycamore yonder. Huh. Looks like he had a spot of bother, too. Fangburn touched Red Tooth with his foot. Ugh, he's dead! Look, the sword's been broken in two! The fox and the rat stood looking at each other, their thoughts running on parallel lines. It was fairly obvious what must be done if they were to save their skins. Right, said Sela. We better work on a good story to tell Clooney when we get back. He's not stupid, so we better get it right. The unlucky pair stumbled off through the nighttime woodland, gesticulating and muttering together, waving a fabric of lies that would hope to be satisfied, Clooney the Scourge.